please like and subscribe. Gibbet Lane by Anthony Gittens Read by Hugh Carr They walked together down the road with a purposeful but laboured stride, which, in addition to their farcically large and elaborate rucksacks, marked them as town dwellers on a weekend hike. Their movements and pace, schooled to a pavement scuttle, lacked rhythm. They fatigued themselves much more by swinging fast downhill than by plodding uphill, and their long periods of silence were due to this fatigue, and not to any absorption or even interest in the scenery. Conclusive proof that they came from the noisome intestines of a large town was afforded by their pale faces and complete ignorance of the purpose of gate fasteners. As they were in Surrey, south of Guildford, and as they expected any and every farmhouse to supply them with tea, we're quite willing to pay, and as they behaved with a transatlantic disregard for other people's property, it was evident that they were Londoners. The taller one, who had a wart, described by his mother as a birthmark and by his father as a damned pimple, on his forehead and sheepish eyes was a Mr. Golan, aged 32, and he worked in the Chancery Lane office of the Belladonna Insurance Company. His friend, Mr. Ponsoby, aged 37, had a large head and rather short hair, and also worked in the Chancery Lane office of the Belladonna Insurance Company. They both had the unimpressionable and sceptical nature common to all insurance agents, and also that deficiency of imagination which is normal in businessmen. In fine, they were stolid creatures, material in outlook, daring gestures at the expense of the League of Nations. Damned old mother's meeting, Mr. Ponsonby would say, and no less daring in their censure of politicians. Start every war they do, Mr. Golan would observe, and raucously contemptuous of the supernatural. Ghosts, all bosh and eyewash, they would chorus disdainfully. It is particularly important to remember that they were so scornful about psychic phenomena. Had they been windy old men, or neurotics, or journalists, no genuine authority could have attached to this story of theirs. They had just, for the fourth time, unsuccessfully requested tea at a farmhouse. Frightfully unsociable people round here remarked Mr. Ponsoby as they trudged on, their huge limp rucksacks likening them to parched camels searching for an oasis. Yes, frightfully, agreed Mr. Golan. There's you know, you think they'd be jolly glad to make a tanner out of two cups of tea. Or two cups of tea out of a tanner. I mean, tannin, rejoined Mr. Ponsoby wittily. I wish I could think of things like that as quickly as you do, George, said Mr. Golan with intense admiration. You know, you ought to write a play. I bet you could do that no coward sort of dialogue as easy as pet. Oh, I don't know, said the gratified Mr. Ponsonby, desperately cranking his mind in hope of churning out another witticism. But it was like winding an empty sausage machine. Nothing emerged. He did try a pun on coward and pat, but even in his own eyes it was a dismal failure, so he hastily revived their original topic. No, they're not so hospitable as people in town, he declared, just as if he were in the habit of dropping into houses in, say, the Cromwell Road and offering the residents threepence for a cup of tea. Hello! Is someone ahead up by that signpost? We'll ask him where the nearest pub is. 
They covered the intervening distance in silence. The man who stood near the old, discolored signpost, occasionally swiping with his stick at the long grass, had a pale oval face with bright eyes set in dark pits, and a thin curved nose which came forth like an unexpected challenge from his meek and otherwise regular features. He was about fifty, and wore a brown tweed shooting hat back to front, with a small feather in one side, very old breeches and dull green stockings, a soiled white cotton scarf tied around his neck and tucked into his faded yellow corduroy waistcoat, and a comparatively new heather mixture Norfolk jacket. The clothes did not hang well on him. It was as if, at one time and another, he had been given each garment by a different employer, for they were oddly contrasted, and all of better material than probably he himself could afford. Altogether, with his rough apparel and sensitive features, he cut an unusual figure. He might have been a poet forced to earn his living on the land, and would indeed have been less conspicuous at the Café Royal than he was here. Mr. Ponsonby, however, was not of this opinion. Typical countryman, he remarked as they approached. Yes, agreed Mr. Golan, wishing that he had been the first to make this astute observation. Shall I ask him, or will you? Mr. Ponsipi said that he would. He straightened his back and tried to look as if he had walked thirty miles that day and was enjoying it, whereas he had only walked seven and was loathing it. Which is the way to the nearest public house? He called out. The man stopped swiping at the grass with his stick and looked at them. Before replying, he deftly decapitated a small clump of rushes. There's one at Falday, he said. Which way's that? Oh, I see. It's on the signpost, said Mr. Ponsonby. You go by that signpost, rejoined the man. It'll be the English Channel you reach before Falday. It swings round in the wind, see? He grasped it with one hand and twisted it. No, it's right. Thanks, said Mr. Golan. Not it'll help you any better, even now, to find Feldy, said the man. If you're strange to these parts, he began chewing a reed. I see you are, he added. This huffed Mr. Ponsby, who, though proud of being a townie, always hoped to pass unidentified as such in the country because, as he candidly confessed, They'll do much more for you, you know, if they think you're one of their sort. Unfortunately, he always failed to pass as one of their sort because he believed that to do in Rome as the Romans do, it was only necessary to wear a toga and sandals. Isn't it rather a waste of taxpayers' money, he said, to put up signposts which are of no use? Squire's orders. Nothing to do with the taxpayers. Very few people use this lane anyway. And in his tone there was something which implied that the lane was rarely frequented. Not because it was out of the way, but because... It had an unpleasant history. He threw away the reed he had been chewing and moved the post again until it was upright. Then he noted the shadow which it cast. The sun was disappearing behind a muddle of dark clouds, and the dim, attenuated shadow struck the base of an oak in the opposite hedge. Ten minutes to five, he observed. You've got about a mile and a half to go. Well, thanks, said Mr. Golan again, for he was no conversationalist at the best of times, and having noticed the lowering sky, he was anxious to reach shelter before it rained. He shook hands with the man and moved towards the lane, which was little more than a path leading to Feldy. Mr. Ponsonby also awarded the stranger a handshake, and at the same time was about to express his thanks when and Mr. Ponsonby afterwards remained positive on this point, the man said, I'll come some of the way with you, 
Well, thanks very much, said Mr. Ponsby, and caught up with his friend Golan, while the man fell into step on the outside of Mr. Ponsby. There's a use for everything, you see, said the man. Golan and Ponsby, appalled by the prospect of another mile and a half, had abruptly subsided into one of their periodic silences. Take that signpost. As a signpost, it's useless. It should say how far it is to Felby. It should say that this lane's called Gibbet Lane. It should quite reasonably always point in the same direction. It doesn't do any of these things. But all the same, it's a pretty good sort of sundial. He spoke swiftly, smoothly, giving scant opportunity for question or comment. And poor old J.C. had such a terrible fright up here. Over a year ago, that was. I thought it was the signpost that did it. Till I got home, I did anyway. J.C.'s my dog, Red Setter. It does look a bit queer in this dull light, don't you think? Mr. Ponsonby glanced back over his shoulder. Come on, growled Mr. Golan, who was concerned about the rapidly darkening sky. Like a gallows, rather, added the man without waiting for reply. Actually, there was a gallows there once. The last man they hanged on it was a farmer named Coulter, James Coulter. Case of wife murder. Two hours after he was dead, they found he was innocent. The next morning, the gibbet was down, struck by lightning, some said. But there were six people in the neighbourhood who swore they'd seen James Coulter during the night. He paused for a moment. Low in the sky, the last pale strand of the sun disappeared, and a small, unexpected wind murmured a requiem in the trees. Then there was silence. The man's voice became more subdued. That's why this lane is called Gibbet Lane. And whatever people may say, there's something mighty queer about it. I never bring J.C. up here now, but I often wonder what he could tell about that afternoon he took flight up here. It was like this. We were walking together down this lane. J.C. was two or three yards in front of me. Mind you, he isn't a nervous dog, and never has been. But he suddenly stopped dead and looked round. His eyes were focused about where I was, but he didn't seem to see me. God only knows what did catch his eye, for I'd never seen such fear in the look of beast or man as I did then. The hair on his back went straight up, and he began edging away as if Al and all the devils were there. We clicked my fingers two or three times and called out quietly, but it didn't have any effect. Then he let out yell and bolted. My God, how he bolted. He went slap down this lane faster than a greyhound could have done, I reckon, and howling all the way. The man nodded ahead to where the gable of a farmhouse was visible. The window under the gable faced up the lane, which was dead straight and, for the most part, hemmed in by high rocky banks, as if it had once been the bed of a stream. There was no grass, no plant life, no vegetation at all on either bank. It was a sombre gully, and shadows were now huddling into the crannies and fissures of its barren side. That's where I used to live with my sister. It's empty now. My sister died last March. Well, J.C. was back there in a flash, and I jumped the gate into the yard before my sister had time to run downstairs and open it for him. You see, she not only heard him coming, but had been looking out of her bedroom window. That's the one you can see from here when he'd started behaving so queerly. 
She'd seen it all. A couple of minutes later, I got back, wondering whether that queer-looking signpost had had anything to do with it, or whether the dog had seen something strange. It said they're more susceptible than human beings to, well, to anything psychic. They can sense the presence of death, too. Anyway, I asked my sister what her opinion was. She said, oh, we must have taken fright at some noise, if you'd been with him at that moment. But I was with him, I said, just behind him. With him? When he bolted? Yes, in fact, I was with him all the way down until he ran off like that. My sister looked at me rather curiously and asked if I'd been drinking. She knew very well, though, that I never do drink, and I told her so. She fixed her eyes very queerly on me then. I saw you come some of the way down, she said. Then I attended to something in the room, and when I looked out again, I... Dick, I'm frightened, she said suddenly and caught hold of my arm. You're telling me the truth, aren't you? Swear to me that you were in the lane when... Nancy, I said, I give you my oath that I was with the dog every step of the way till he bolted from me. Why do you ask? She went very white then, and I thought she was going to faint. I don't understand it, she cried. I can see every inch of that lane from my window, and as God's my witness, I swear there was not a soul in it when J.C. took fright. The dog was absolutely alone. You can imagine what a shock that gave me, continued the man after a moment's pause. For I remembered that the dog had been looking where I was, and yet... Yet, he said very slowly, there was something about me, shall I say, something in me, so horrible that it sent an animal half mad with fear. It's a sort of thing that can easily turn a man's reason, isn't it, if he thinks about it much at this point, the man stopped abruptly. And Mr. Ponsonby, more perturbed than he cared to show, realized that the story was at an end. He realized also with genuine uneasiness that they were now walking down the very lane where this peculiar incident had taken place. At that moment, he wished he was miles from the spot. Subsequently, he wished most emphatically that he had never gone down the lane at all. It served him as a perennial topic of conversation, of course, but the whole of that afternoon's experience was one that he would never have voluntarily undergone again. What a remarkable thing, he said mastering his uneasiness. What's remarkable? asked Mr. Golan, speaking for the second time since leaving the signpost. They passed into gloomy shadows formed by a dark conspiracy of elms and the failing afternoon light. Westward, the rain was already sheeting the skyline. Why, the story this gentleman has just told us, retorted Mr. Ponsonby. Mr. Golan looked about him with a perplexed frown, and then stared very hard at his friend. What the dickens do you mean? he demanded in bewilderment. What story? What gentleman? Mr. Ponsonby glanced sharply to his right, stopped dead, and remained as rigid as if he had just awoken from a nightmare. His mouth sagged open, his skin turned the colour of chalk. My God! he exclaimed, and again slowly, almost in a whisper. My God! 
He wheeled round and peered up the dim perspective of the lane. Beside the signpost, which stood gauntly against a dado of pale clouds, was a man. An indistinct but recognizable figure, swiping with a stick at the long grass. An hour later, the two of them were in the pub at Feldy and had related their experience to the barman. Mr. Ponsonby was still considerably shaken. Outside, the rain was sousing every inch of ground and mists had descended as if to hold unholy communion with the deep, cold lake among the pines. Gridley, said the barman, and spelt it out. Mr. Oliver Gridley, that's who it was. It's a mercy he'd gone when you went back. Why? Because that story about him and the dog is true, every word. It turned him up pretty bad. He's never been the same man since, and if he knew that something of the sort had happened again today... We don't talk much about it in these parts. It was Grinley, you know, that murdered James Coulter's wife, and had Coulter hanged for it on that spot where the signpost is now. There's another queer thing. The way Mr. Grinley is always up alone by that signpost seems to sort of fascinate him. You can't explain these things, though. It's my belief that it's wisest not to think about them. But there's some would like to know, though they don't care to hang about Gibbet Lane and find out, said the barman slowly, just what that dog of his saw, which sent him hell for leather back home, pretty near stark mad with fear. Mr. Ponsonby, who was paler than usual, glanced at his own blurred reflection in the dark, rain-slashed window. I shouldn't, he said, and ordered two more double whiskies.